author, uh, author, artist, uh, color. Creator, uh, writer, and illustrator of Schlock, Schlock Mercenary. Um, I have a colorist now in my employ, uh, Travis Walton. Uh, I say in my employ. He's a he's a partner. We, we're collaborating now on the final artwork for each story. So, so is uh, Schlock Mercenary the only thing that you work on currently? Right now, it is you know ninety five percent of what I work on. Um, the uh, you know, there's the Schlock Mercenary books. We've got a board game coming out, which is obviously also Schlock Mercenary. Um, I participate in the Writing Excuses podcast, 15 minutes long because you're in a hurry and we're not that smart, with uh, Brandon Sanderson, Dan Wells, Mary Robin, and Kowal. Um, but that's not fiction. That's, um, that's a how-to for people who are interested in writing genre fiction. Um, I've also got some, you know, short story projects and... Uh, uh, novel outlines taking shape, but I need to put a lot of the uh, revenue-generating schlock mercenary projects to bed before I uh, tackle something as uh, as purely speculative as you know writing a short story and sending it off to a publisher somewhere. So, what, what was your inspiration for schlock mercenary? Where did that come from? Um, you know, the word inspiration is uh, is probably the wrong word. Um, I looked at web comics and thought this looks like a fun way to tell a story. Um, I've never had any shortage of stories, uh, but this looked like a fun way to tell a story. So I, you know, just began rifling through the brain. Well, what sort of a story do I want to tell? Well, I love science fiction, so it's got to be science fiction. Um, and the comics is a visual medium. So it's got to have something visually interesting going on. So it's going to be science fiction with lots of aliens and spaceships and stuff blowing up. And what's the best way to make that happen? Well, you know, if the main characters are mercenaries, we're following a mercenary company, then we are guaranteed to be seeing uh, lots of action. Uh, or we can have, you know, episodes that are really boring where they can't get paid because there is no action. But but for the most part, I picked mercenaries in space because it was something that I thought would be fun to tell stories about and uh, subsequently illustrate. Most of your characters are human. Right? Most of the characters are human, principally because it's easiest for the reader to relate to the emotional expressions of human faces. Uh, if the characters aren't human, uh, it typically works better in a book or in a movie in which they've been made to look human. Um, it works well in a book. I've found that when I'm reading books that are about, you know, entirely alien species, in my head I end up picturing them as human when they describe emotions, because that's the only way I know how to picture those sorts of emotions. Uh, but yeah, I've got, I've got aliens, and most of the aliens emote the same way that humans do. That's why the, the Uniox, the ones with the single great big eyeball, have two eyebrows so that I can do angry eyes um, or surprise or whatever. You know, I can, I can communicate emotion. One of your main characters is not human. Hmm? One of your main characters is not human. Oh, yeah. Well, Sergeant Schlock, of yeah. course, is uh, the... Uh, 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 another reviewer years and years ago referred to him as the eponymous Schlock, which means the Schlock for whom the comic is named. Um, not a very useful word if you have to define it, because then you're not saving any time. Um, He's a carbosilicate amorph. He's a blob with uh, with no no discernible organs, really. He's you know sort of a homogenous structure, except for the fact that he has two eyes, which uh, are mismatched in size, and you know he uses those to communicate with, um, well, and a mouth. But when we talk about communicating emotion, you know it's it's in the eyes and in the mouth. Um, but the eyes as discernible organs clearly aren't originally his. So, he stole them. What have been some of your biggest challenges? Um, honestly, the biggest challenge was monetizing the audience that I had. Uh, my audience has grown steadily over the last decade, um, and it grew very, very quickly for the first three years of the comic. Uh, by the time the comic was four years old, uh, I had a large enough audience that I could start doing books. But I didn't know that, uh, and so the the challenge lay in 
doing the market research, doing the, doing the surveys, uh, looking into the, the manufacturing processes, looking into you know, various options for merchandising, and figuring out what it was that, that I could afford to take a chance on uh, in order to mass produce, to sell to readers, in order to make a living at this. Because ad revenue has never accounted for uh, enough of, uh, well, ad re there's never been enough ad revenue to just live off of that alone. Uh, ad revenue is not bad, but, uh, but I need more money than that. Um, and so in 2004, 2005, and early 2006, um, we were researching ways to put the comic into print and talking to the readers and finding out, you know, how much would you pay for a book? How big you, do you expect the book to be? Uh, how much, uh, you know, how much additional content do you want in the book? Uh, and that research process was uh, very time-consuming, very exacting, and I'm, uh, I'm pleased and more than a little proud that we were able to get it right. Uh, you know, we predicted that we'd be able to sell about 2,000 books right out of the gate and that we'd be able to sell them at a particular price point, and we based that off of numbers we got from our surveys and our other research, and then we turned out to sell, I think, 1,912 books, copies of the first book we put into print during the 30-day window of pre-orders, which was brilliant and outstanding and wonderful because it paid the bills for six months, and that told me, well, you now have six months to put out the next book. Time to get to work. Time to get to work. It was... I, I, I probably got really lucky. You know, let's <laughs> let's not uh, let's not mince words. I'm sure there was a large element of luck in the fact that uh, you know, for any appreciable, any respectable margin of error, I was dead on with the number of books we sold and the number of books we predicted we'd sell. Um, but uh, you, there's an element of luck there. Do you still have a day job now, or is it all? Oh, heavens no. I, I write and illustrate Schlock Mercenary full-time. I've done that since uh, 2004. 2004. Question I just thought of. T tell us about the age range that you target. And have you ever thought I am about aiming, it? well, I am aiming the comic for people who, uh, if, if people with a reasonable vocabulary. So, you know, really nerdy junior high school and high school students who are, you know, very bookish and love science fiction. Uh, or any grown-up who loves uh, science fiction in book form, principally. Uh, movie science fiction is usually dumb. Uh, you know, Star Wars and Star Trek are ostensibly science fiction, but there's not a whole lot of science in them. Um, and I wanted something that had a little more, you know, a little more science to it, uh, while still being, you know, goofy space opera fun. Um, what I found is that writing for people who have a decent vocabulary uh, and who have a, an appreciation of, you know, longer plot structures uh, will still satisfy kids. You know, my, my 10 year old reads my books. Uh, my 14 year old uh, has started rereading my books and is realizing that they are a lot more fun than they were when he read them when he was 10. Uh, and he's excited for the next book to come out. So. A parent can have their preteen. Absolutely. Not have to worry about. They're not going to have to worry about uh, about them learning new words that only have four letters, um, or worry about uh, you know nudity or you know on-screen sex um, or you know graphic uh, on-panel violence. Um, when I say not have to worry, you know, we I'm getting into a zombie storyline right now that begins with a character accidentally. Uh, ripping his own head off with a, uh, a giant Waldo um, when he's showing off and saying, oh yeah, I could, I could pick my nose with these giant robotic arms, and then he, he dies. But the panel in which the robot has plucked him out of the cage and thrown him across the room by his ruined head is a black and white panel. So you can tell what has happened, but your imagination is going to fill in the, the gory details, which probably means, uh, parents, that your children are going to imagine a much gorier picture than anything I drew, which is what you want them to do. Um, tell, us a, tell us a bit more about this game. How uh, involved are you? What uh, oh, type of um, game? The game is called Schlock Mercenary Capital Offensive. It's a tactical shooter um, with, uh, uh, it's a you know, board game, a gridded board, Moving, you know, moving pieces around, rolling dice, 
uh, special abilities on cards, weapon power-ups, that sort of, that sort of thing. Um, and it comes out in June. Pre-orders are open right now at uh, gamesalute.com if you look for Schlock um, on that site. My involvement, uh, I met an author named Walter Hunt at uh, Worldcon in, I think it was Denver. Um, Denver? Might have been Los Angeles. Honestly, I, it's, it's been so long. But he and I got to talking and he fell in love with the strip. And he's an avid board gamer. And he thought, there needs to be a board game about this. And I thought, board game? Why does there need to be a board game about this? I'm not a board game guy. Um, and he talked to some friends of his, got them hooked on the strip, and those friends, Kevin Nunn, Kevin Brusky, uh, Nick Vitek, uh, started put to get, putting together the game. Uh, Kevin created the game. Nick is doing most of the, or has done at this point, uh, all of the uh, uh, tile layout design. And they handled all of the game design and game balance issues. My job was to sit down and play the game and figure out if I was having fun. Uh, and it turned out that I was. I really enjoyed it. had a great time. Um, matter of fact, when they play tested it for me at uh, Gen Con in 2011, um, I sat down at the table with them. I didn't say this out loud, but I sat down at the table with them with the plan to kill the project because I didn't expect to enjoy the game. Um, and the fact that in one play session they turned my opinion around 180 degrees um, uh, I think speaks highly for the game they designed. Uh, I'm, I'm behind it. I played it at Lunacon uh, a couple of weeks ago in New York. Um, again, we just played the demo box. Played it with a dozen different people. We only had a two-player scenario. We sat down and played, and everybody had fun. They're excited to, they're excited to pick it up. So, You're doing the artwork? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the art was... Uh, that was what I spent January and most of February on, was uh, art for the board game. And it fits with the theme of the webcomic, really? Oh, absolutely, yeah. The, the fans of the comic will enjoy it. People who are not necessarily fans of the comic um, will wonder about the wording of certain rules, um, because it may not necessarily be the most explicit way to describe a rule, but it's, you know, in world it makes perfect sense. I'm not saying the game's confusing if you don't read the comic, but like, uh, Tagon has an ability called Only Cheaters Prosper, which is the ability that lets him re-roll one die for any die roll uh, that uh, that he's involved in. Um, you know, so if he's rolling three dice, he can choose to re-roll the high number because he's aiming low, or re-roll the low number because he's aiming high. Uh, but the special ability is called Only Cheaters Prosper because that's one of the maxims of maximally effective mercenaries in the strip. So, so there are things like that throughout the game, you know, in-world references. I understand that you're a foodie. I, I am a foodie. Uh, probably comes from the fact that, uh, uh, you know, long ago I realized that life is too short to always only eat the same things all the time. Um, and so I tried lots and lots of different foods. And at first I thought that it was about trying foods with different ingredients. You know, I've eaten squirrel. Um, and one of the worst things about squirrel is that we thought we needed to cook it longer than we think we needed to cook it because we were worried about how long maybe it needed to be cooked. And we ended up with a very rubbery, uh, rubbery, gamey disaster that also had squirrel fur in it, which was not my favorite food. But once you, once you get on to that ride, you realize that eating can be like a roller coaster ride. I don't know what I'm going to get. I don't know what I'm going to experience. This is an experience. Maybe it's going to be horrible and I'm never going to come back here again. Um, maybe it's going to be spectacular and I'm going to talk about this restaurant for years. Last night we went to Ginza Sushi and I saw natto on the menu. And natto, for those of you who are not in the know, is fermented soybeans. It, so you've got soybeans. You know, it looks like baked beans. Only if you stir it up, it's like stringy and gooey, like melted mozzarella cheese, only it's not necessarily hot. It's, and it smells like, um, well, it smells like a couple of things. Depending on, depending on the way your brain is geared, it might smell like, oh my goodness, this has gone bad. Or, again, depending on how you think, it might smell like, oh, it smells a little bit like beer. 
or maybe sourdough bread. Okay, beer and sourdough bread are wonderful, wonderful smells. I don't drink beer, uh, but I love the smell of it. I love the smell of sourdough bread. I love the smell of a really, really hearty farmstead blue cheese that smells like it was it was aged in an old sock. I like that. Uh, and so natto, I thought, well, everybody says it's gross. I'm going to get some. Uh, and then I asked the waitress, uh, do you want, do, do, should I get it before everything I eat, or should I get it last? And she said, oh, get it first, because if you don't like it, the ginger will take care of the flavor. Um, and so where did being a foodie come from? Well, I think I've answered that question. Uh, what is being a foodie about? It's about, you know, trying new things. And the most important safety tip I can offer any of you is talk to your waiter or waitress. Ask them what their recommendation is. And sometimes you will have hilarious stories to tell just about the waiter and waitress. We went to a diner in, uh, on our way to Reno and, uh, and Sal asked the waitress, so tell me about the meatloaf. Because you know, you're going to a little American diner the meatloaf is something that you could probably only get there. You know, they've got their own meatloaf recipe. And her response was, well, they made it today. We didn't order the meatloaf because she didn't care what was in the meatloaf. It, there was nothing special about it. And frankly, nothing at that restaurant was worth caring about. But uh, at least I got a story out of it. And, uh, and I'm still looking for the diner that's got really good meatloaf. So, so how would you like the... Uh Soybeans. Oh, the natto. Um, I'm, I need to order it again where it's not in a sushi roll, where it's oh. actually in a... The way it's I just, to be I just need to get. I just need to buy a box of the, the, and just shovel into my face and pretend it's good sourdough. So, we'll see what happens. One last question. I understand you have a pretty interesting story about Will Wheaton. About Will Wheaton? Oh, um, we, uh, we were playing Munchkin at... Uh, uh, Linicon, which was a little Linux Expo sci-fi convention in Austin, Texas. Um, and Munchkin comes with blank cards. And I illustrated uh, blank cards for each of the people who's going to be playing uh, in that game. Uh, Eric uh, Raymond, who's an open source guy, um, I illustrated uh, you know, an Eric Raymond card that had to do with uh, open source stuff. I don't remember what his monster was. Um, I illustrated a card for Steve Jackson, uh, who was there, you know, playing Munchkin, a Steve Jackson's game, Munchkin, with Steve Jackson, lots of fun. Um, I illustrated his card with the Secret Service. Uh, you know, if Steve Jackson is fighting the Secret Service, Steve Jackson always wins. Um, so, you know, I made up little rules, and one of the cards was William Effing Shatner, because if you've read uh, Will Wheaton's book, Just a Geek, he talks about when he met William Shatner, and William Shatner went from being, you know, Captain James T. Kirk to being William Effing Shatner because he was kind of a jerk when they first met. Uh, and so I drew, you know, a William Shatner with the toupee blowing up off of his head. And the caption said, you know, you've seen him without his toupee, you must die. If Will Wheaton is present, he must help you fight. Um, and uh, Shatner was a, a level 10 monster. Okay. Um, so Steve kicks down a door, Steve Jackson kicks down a door, and it's William Effing Shatner. And he turns to Will and says, Will, would you like to help me kill William Effing Shatner? And Will says, I would be delighted. I would love to. And they start piling on the weapons, and then uh, Eric Raymond plays the card and his clone on William Effing Shatner. So now it's level 20. And Eric Flint, who's sitting across, Eric Flint's an editor with uh, uh, editor and author with uh, Banned Books. Eric Flint looks at the table and says, I've seen this episode. <laughs> and so we all had a really good laugh. And then, uh, and then between Will and Steve, they managed to throw enough uh, damage down that they took out William Effing Shatner and his clone. Uh, and Will went on to win that game because he's, he is sharp. He knows how to play cards. He knows how to... He knows how to game the system. He's a gamer. He's good. Um, we didn't see it coming, but his last his last three levels, you know, bam, bam, bam. Um, so Will won the game, but I felt like the winner of the night because everybody was so delighted to have gotten a chance to uh, take down.
the former Captain James T. Kirk and his clone. That's unexpected fun. It was a good time. So, so Will Wheaton didn't give you any uh, terrible stories about his grandma dying? No. No, he didn't. Want to buy an episode of Big Bang Theory. I actually don't watch Big okay, Bang Theory, so, so I can't, uh, can't comment. Can't comment. I'm, I'm not a pop culture guru at all. My name's Howard Taylor. I write and illustrate Schlock Mercenary, which you can find on the internet uh, seven days a week, uh, 365 or 66 days a year, for the last dozen years at schlockmercenary.com. It's epic science fiction being told four panels at a time. Thanks, Howard. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Just a sec. All right. Watermelon, rutabaga, sweet potato pie. My name's Howard Taylor, and hopefully I'm not too hot. <laughs>